In 1938, railroad engineers called Henry Dreyfus's streamlined bullet-nosed locomotive a joke. They mocked it as publicity over progress, and they laughed it off as pointless. Yet within months, that ridiculed machine would shatter speed records, become America's fastest steam locomotive, and drag a dying railroad back from the brink during the Great Depression. How did an outsider's idea, mocked by experts, rewrite the future of trains? And what drove the stakes so high that losing was not an option? By 1933, the American railroad industry faced a crisis that few could have predicted just a decade earlier. In 1929, trains carried more than 47 billion passenger miles, a figure that seemed to promise endless growth. But as the Great Depression tightened its grip, those numbers plummeted. Four years later, barely 23 billion passenger miles remained, a staggering loss of nearly half the traffic. The scale of the collapse was visible in every empty waiting room, every silent platform. Terminals that had once been alive with the shuffle and chatter of travelers now echoed with uncertainty. Ticket agents watched the clock. Porters waited for passengers who never came. The reasons for this decline were everywhere, and none of them could be ignored. The Model A. Ford rolled off assembly lines in Detroit, affordable enough to put private travel within reach for millions. By 1935, Americans owned over 26 million cars, and the country's expanding web of paved highways made it easier than ever to bypass the rails. Road trips, once a rare adventure, became a part of daily life. Families packed up and headed out, drawn by the promise of freedom and the open road. For the first time, the railroad's monopoly on long-distance travel was broken, not by a rival company, but by a new way of thinking about movement itself. The rise of private cars created fierce competition for passenger traffic. Yet the threat from the highways was only part of the story. In the skies above, commercial aviation was finding its wings. The introduction of the Douglas DC-3 in 1936 changed everything. Suddenly, scheduled flights between cities like New York and Chicago were not just possible. They were practical. A trip that once took a full day and night by train could now be completed in a matter of hours. Business travelers, celebrities, and the wealthy were among the first to trade Pullman cars for pressurized cabins and panoramic views at 10,000 feet. The glamour of flight, combined with its speed, captured the public imagination in a way that no locomotive could match. Inside the boardrooms of the great railroads, Anxiety grew with every quarterly report. The New York Central's 20th Century Limited, once the pride of the industry, saw its earnings fall from $10 million in 1928 to a fraction of that by the mid-1930s. Budgets shrank. Expansion plans disappeared. Maintenance crews stretched dwindling resources and layoffs became routine. Engineers who had once been the heroes of the rails now faced uncertain futures. The mood in those rooms settled into a quiet anxiety. Newspapers ran stories about record-breaking flights and new highways, not about trains. Investors demanded answers. The public, dazzled by speed and novelty, turned away. For railroad leaders, the only hope was a bold gamble, something radical enough to make Americans believe in trains again. In this atmosphere of urgency and doubt, even the most unconventional ideas started to look like the only way forward. Hopes for a comeback rested on a dramatic reinvention of rail travel. Henry Dreyfus walked into the New York Central offices in 1937 with a portfolio that looked nothing like a railroad engineer's. He was famous for the Western Electric Model 302 telephone, a black squat device that fit comfortably in the hand and the Hoover vacuum cleaner a machine so streamlined it looked ready for flight. His reputation was built on making things people used every day feel natural and look beautiful. But in the world of steam locomotives, those credentials meant little. To the mechanical engineers who had spent decades perfecting the J-1 Hudson, Dreyfus was an outsider. 
worse, an artist. Rumors spread that New York Central's decision to hire him was nothing more than a publicity stunt, a desperate move to distract from empty trains and falling revenues. The trade journals were blunt. What could a designer of toasters possibly know about 400-ton locomotives? Inside the workshops, skepticism turned to open ridicule. Engineers called the early sketches kitchen appliances on wheels. The concept drawings, rounded, finned, with a nose that swept forward like a torpedo, seemed to them like a joke. Steam engines, they argued, were already at the peak of their evolution. The J1 Hudson's boxy boiler and exposed driving rods were not just tradition. They were the product of years of hard-won experience. Streamlining, in their eyes, was just a layer of sheet metal, style with no substance, a waste of time and money. Dreyfus did not flinch. When he signed the contract with New York Central in 1937, he brought with him a philosophy that form and function could not be separated. He believed a locomotive should be efficient, but also inspiring. His notes from the period talk about clean lining, eliminating anything that interrupted the flow of air or the eye. He studied the way wind moved over surfaces, not just for beauty, but for speed. The engineers rolled their eyes. In private meetings, they dismissed wind resistance as a problem for airplanes, not trains. The real work, they insisted, happened in the firebox, the boiler, the rods and wheels. Dreyfus, with his sharp suits and art school sketches, was an interloper in a world of grease and steel. Yet the pressure from above was relentless. Executives needed a miracle, and Dreyfus offered one thing the old guard could not, the promise of something new. He pored over technical blueprints and spent hours with draftsmen, translating his vision into specifications that could actually be built. He argued that passengers did not just buy tickets for speed, they bought an experience, a sense of wonder. His proposals landed on desks alongside grim financial reports and lists of layoffs. Some engineers muttered that the railroad had lost its mind. Others quietly wondered if, just this once, the outsider might be right. By the end of 1937, the contract was signed. Ten new locomotives would be built each one wrapped in Dreyfus's radical shrouding. The bullet nose was coming to the New York Central, whether the engineers liked it or not. Wind tunnel models lined the long table in the New York Central's engineering lab. Each one, a scaled down Hudson with subtle differences, a rounded nose here, a sharper fin there, sat waiting for judgment. The air in the room was thick with skepticism and cigarette smoke. Technical staff, some still in their shop coats, gathered around as the first model entered the tunnel. When the fans roared to life, strips of wool and fine smoke revealed the truth. Above 60 miles per hour, the air did not glide over the boiler. It fought every inch, swirling into pockets of chaos that dragged the engine back. The dials told the rest. At those speeds, nearly a third of the locomotive's power vanished into the wind, 30% lost, not to friction or grade, but to the invisible hand of drag. The numbers were impossible to ignore. A standard Hudson, barreling across upstate New York, was wasting more energy on the air than on the rails. The old arguments about brute force and boxy boilers sounded hollow in the face of hard data. Dreyfus's bullet nose once dismissed as a designer's fantasy, now offered a way to reclaim that lost power. The model with the streamlined shroud cut through the air with less resistance, the wool strips flowing smooth and unbroken. The math was simple. Less drag meant more speed, or the same speed with less fuel. For a railroad on the edge, every bit counted. Bullet nose. In the boardroom, the conversation shifted from ridicule to resolve. Executives pored over charts showing the power budget of a locomotive at speed. Rolling resistance, track friction, mechanical losses, each took a slice. But at high velocity, the biggest slice was now labeled air. The decision came down to risk and reward. Ten locomotives, each wrapped in Dreyfus's shrouding, would be built for the flagship 
20th Century Limited. It was a commitment not just to a look, but to a principle, that science, not tradition, would drive the next era of rail travel. Risk. Science. Meeting minutes from early 1938 captured the moment. The order for 10 streamlined J3A Hudsons went to the American Locomotive Company. The project was greenlit on the promise of aerodynamic savings, with the hope that passengers and profits would follow. No one could guarantee success, but the evidence was there in black and white. 30% of the engine's muscle, ready to be won back from the wind. For the first time, the future of the railroad depended not only on steel and steam, but on the shape of the air itself. 30%. A locomotive crew gathered in the early dawn, eyes fixed on the bullet nose of the new J3A Hudson. The shrouded engine rolled out of the yard, its gray flanks glinting in the half-light, steam swirling tight against the streamlined shell. On board, a speed recorder was wired to the drive wheels, its needle poised for proof. A dynamometer car, packed with engineers and officials, rattled behind, ready to document every mile. The test run began on the water level route, a stretch of track famed for its long, straight miles between Albany and Syracuse. The fireman stoked the boiler to the red line, while the engineer eased the throttle open listening for any sign of strain. At first, the train accelerated like any other Hudson, but as the needle swept past 80, then 90, the difference became clear. The old J1s would have begun to labor, their boxy shapes fighting the wind. The J3A, wrapped in Dreyfus's shrouding, seemed to slip through the air, the roar of the wind muff muffled by the clean lines. Inside the dynamometer car, pencils scratched across timing sheets. The speedometer's pointer crept higher, 95, 100, 105. The train held steady, the ride smooth, the engine's exhaust sharp and regular. Crew members exchanged glances. The line's mechanical limit had always been the wind, not the wheels. Now, the bullet nose cut that barrier down. At 110 miles per hour, the locomotive showed no sign of faltering. The test team checked their watches, then checked again. The J3A was not just touching a new ceiling, it was cruising there. On a long, open stretch, the engineer pushed the throttle further. The locomotive surged forward, the speedometer nudging past 115, then 120. For a moment, the train was the fastest thing on rails in America. The timing sheets caught the proof, over 120 miles per hour sustained for a handful of heartbeats, then settling back to a steady 100 plus. No American steam engine had ever carried passengers this fast for so long. The crew in the cab felt the difference in their bones. The engine ran cool, the bearings silent, the boiler pressure rock steady. The aerodynamic shell did more than promise, it delivered. The test run ended with handshakes and quiet awe. In the days that followed, the numbers were checked and checked again. The data was clear. The J3A had shattered the old limits. Where the J1 had struggled to hold 90, the new locomotive could cruise above 100 mile after mile. The charts, the timing sheets, and the photographs of the needle all told the same story. In the New York Central's offices, the results landed like thunder. Dreyfus, once dismissed as a stylist, was vindicated by cold, hard numbers. The engineers who had scoffed at the bullet nose now studied its curves in silence. The gamble had paid off. The 20th Century Limited would soon race across the heartland faster than any train before it. For the first time in years, the railroad had a reason to believe in speed and in the power of new ideas. The 20th Century Limited's relaunch with the J3A Hudson was more than a publicity coup. It was a commercial breakthrough. Advertisements promised a 16-hour run between New York and Chicago, a schedule that felt almost impossible just a few years earlier. Business travelers and celebrities lined up for tickets, drawn by both the speed and the spectacle. The train's new premium fare structure did not scare them off. It only added to the sense of exclusivity. 
On board, every detail was engineered for comfort and efficiency. From the crimson carpet rolled out at the station to the smooth, almost silent ride at over 100 miles per hour. Behind the glamour, a trio of mechanical upgrades powered the train's success. The boiler ran at higher pressures than its predecessors, pushing more steam through the cylinders with each stroke. Roller bearings on every axle reduced friction, letting the locomotive run cooler and faster over long distances. Lightweight alloys in the running gear trimmed unnecessary pounds, helping the engine accelerate and brake with a precision that older models could not match. The result was a seamless blend of style and substance, a machine that delivered on every promise the advertisements made. For a brief window, the 20th Century Limited became the gold standard of American travel. Revenues rebounded, and the railroad's financial reports finally offered good news. The streamlined Hudson was not just a design statement, it was a technical and economic victory, proof that innovation could still draw crowds and keep the rails alive, even as new challenges waited just around the corner. By the late 1940s, the streamlined J3A Hudsons that once turned heads at every station found themselves outpaced by a new force, diesel electric locomotives. The EMDE units, with their boxy frames and relentless efficiency, started to take over mainline routes. Railroads, pressed by operating costs and the lure of modernity, saw little reason to keep feeding coal and water to even the most graceful steam engines. The J3A's bullet nose, once a symbol of progress, became a relic almost overnight. Scrap invoices from 1950 tell the story in cold numbers. All 10 of Dreyfus's streamlined Hudsons were cut up for metal within a dozen years of their debut. No museum petition, no preservation society, not even a private collector managed to save one. The very engines that had promised a new era vanished without ceremony. Their steel repurposed for a world that had moved on. For the men who had doubted Dreyfus, it was a quiet vindication of their prediction. Steam, no matter how beautiful, belonged to the past. Yet the influence of the bullet nose refused to disappear. Across the world, designers searching for speed and efficiency turned to streamlined forms. Japan's Shinkansen launched in 1964, and France's TG5 racing across the countryside by the 1980s. Both wore elongated noses, shaped by the same aerodynamic logic that once set the J3A apart. The original may have been lost to the torch, but its spirit traveled farther than any timetable could measure. In the end, the lines drawn by an outsider in a New York office shaped the future of high-speed rail on three continents. Innovation rarely waits for permission. Today, every high-speed train, from Japan's Shinkansen to France's TGV, owes its streamlined nose to Dreyfus's once-mocked vision. Outsiders still challenge what insiders dismiss, and progress often arrives wearing the unfamiliar. The lesson is simple. The world changes fastest when we listen to those willing to look foolish first. What risks are we laughing off today?